Hi and welcome to another narration presented by yours truly, Cryptid's Roost. Let's just take a moment's silence for all the haters. That's enough. Be sure to check out the blooper reel at the end of the video, which is then followed by the end screen where you will find more videos listed. So grab your coffee, sit back and enjoy the show. And don't forget, where fear is, happiness is not. Bite of the Greasy Dead This awesome story is written by the author Mac Ralston. It was such a simple order. Two number twos, a number one with honey mustard and a bitey kid's meal. It was so simple, in fact, that I didn't even bother to notice who ordered it. A person, an actual person, and not just any person. Bruce, Big Bruce as we called him. I was about to correct him when he apologised and did it himself. He's been here enough times to know we don't serve number twos anymore. It's even crossed off with the spray paint on the menu sign. And even if we did, I'm not sure Big Bruce needed two of them anyway. Okay, forget the number twos, my bad. I'll just stick with the number nine and the bitey kids meal. You got kids, Bruce? I asked through my headset. There was a little delay before he responded. Nah, but... He stopped himself, clearing his throat. I, uh, collect the toys, he admitted, somewhat embarrassed. It reminds me of when I used to come here with my dad before... Was he infected? I asked. Y yeah I'm sorry, Bruce. Uh, first window for me, okay? I watched Bruce nod through the drive through camera as he pulled around to my window. 770, I said, taking Bruce's cash from him. How have you been, Bruce? Fine, brother, he said. You? I've been good. How's, uh, what's her name? I glanced across the kitchen to the other window, watching Tina push open the zero contact window towards a customer. I turned back to Bruce. Tina, I said, she's fine, thanks. I smiled, extended my arm through the side window with his bag, grease staining the brown paper that sagged at the bottom. I pray to God one day y'all will get those bitey burgers back. It's killing me, man. I know, I said. Corporates teased the idea, maybe doing a veggie option or something. But they don't want to risk another outbreak, you know? I don't blame them, brother. I should really cut back myself. But sometimes we need our comfort foods, he smiled, nodding as he pulled away into the night. I bid Big Bruce a farewell wave before turning to the drive through camera again. Empty, as usual. Bruce was right, you know. We'd get more business from actual people if we had more actual food. I get the mad cow really restricts the burger and dairy options, but there's got to be more to the fast food aside from cheeseburgers, right? What do lactose intolerant people eat for crying out loud? See, most of the time it's not actual people that walk through our drive through Call them the infected, walkers, flesh eaters, biters, or the obvious, zombies. Corporate is very strict about us calling them one thing and one thing only, customers. Our so-called customers started showing up some four weeks after the first reports of the massive outbreak. Now, if you've watched any horror movies, you might wrongly assume these things to be the living dead. They are not. Brain dead, perhaps. But these are infected individuals. 
We never imagined that BSE could transfer through cooked meats or milk products, but here we are. The world's a different place now and we had to adapt. Look, I've seen some shit, literally too. Like that dookie some idiot dropped in the sink in the men's restroom. But not even that could have prepared me for what happened on week 5. It was horrible and that's even an understatement. Literal corpses lie in the floor in our dining room. Blood splattered all over the walls and ceiling. And those screams, those awful screams. I admit I took this job for the minimum wage and the chance to work alongside Tina. But after seeing what I saw, the 15 bucks an hour didn't come close to compensating. But thank God I have this job, cause there aren't many left. We were this close to bombing the shit out of ourselves. Total atomic annihilation. They were gonna corral survivors into bunkers and obliterate the nation from here to kingdom come. But plans changed all of a sudden. Some scientists found out that the reason for the widespread attacks orchestrated by the infected was due to a specific compound found in the brain. I guess the biters really liked whatever was in them. So the worldwide governments began pumping the stuff out, manufacturing it, claiming it was chunks of cow brain from all the millions of inedible cattle around the world. A few backdoor handshakes later and, well, we have where we are at now. Every fast food chain was approached with this billion dollar idea. Hand out samples of the compound to the infected and receive financial compensation. We don't have an actual dollar figure still, but it must have been a lot because they all immediately adopted the program within weeks. Every couple of days we get shipments of compound patties at our back door. Now they claim it's cow brains, but after we forced our lead shift manager to watch Soylent Green, he's convinced the stuff's made out of dead people and we've been placing our bets ever since. Regardless of their content however, the compound patties go like hotcakes for the infected. They can't get enough and because they're so busy eating the patties, they've got no reason to attack people. Thus, crisis solved, right? I work at this place called The Bite. It's not as well known as the big name chains, but we keep busy. Essentially, we are McDonald's mixed with checkers or rallies if you've survived out in the Midwest. God help you. In the sense that our drive through is split in half, with one side devoted to genuine fast food and the other for, well, the zombies. Tonight, Tina's on compound duty while I've got the regular side. We are hounded up the ass to keep the sides separated to avoid cross-contamination. We do our best, but I can't help but visit with Tina on and off. Aside from us, there's Dennis, our shift manager, Rebecca, our lobby cashier, George, our league cook, and Chuck, the GM, who happened to surprise us tonight with a routine evaluation, which has Dennis, Mr. Employee of the Month, shaking in his non-slip boots. Personally and honestly, I'm not very concerned. It's Thursday. Thursdays are never busy. Oh shit, Dennis said, wrapping a tight fist around his chin as he bit down onto his knuckle. What? I asked. He pointed to the drive through camera behind me, showcasing Tina's drive through side. One hell of a line, and by line, I mean mass horde of the infected. 
Did I mention that on the compound side it's always busy? I went with Dennis to grab another frozen box of patties from the freezer, being sure to wash my hands, as I was told, cause God knows that's helping. But I was stopped when he noticed that Chuck had beat us to it. He looked worried, those calculating eyes of his darting around as trembling fingers gripped onto that company phone. I mean, he was standing in a freezer, but he looked more jittery than usual. Dennis, a word please, he said, looking at me and prompting my excusal. I shrugged Dennis off, turning back to the kitchen where George met me with his eyes. The hell's going on? I'm out of patties. I know, I said. They're having a meeting or something. In the freezer? I nodded. I wasn't going to interrupt my higher ups, even if we were running low on inventory. After all, it's pretty stupid that we even bothered to cut the things in the first place. Our customers clearly don't care. Corporate said it was something about keeping up appearances or something. The freezer door popped open with a metallic clang after a long foreboding silence. Neither George nor I mustered up the audacity to say anything. Chuck then marched right past us in a beeline from the freezer in a tizzy, leaving Dennis in his dust. He approached us, not saying a word. So? I said, trying to read his face. It was a blend of surprise and sheer panic. He opened his mouth, but nothing came out. Spit it out, man, George said. You've got the patties or not. Tina's running low and I'm all out. Dennis shook his head with a glazed over, fear-stricken look in his eyes. The truck, he sputtered. It tipped over. What truck? I asked. The truck full of patties, he said as matter-of-factly as he could. The driver took a sharp turn and it tipped. Within seconds, it was swarmed by a mob of roaming biters. Dennis shook his head, his thoughts clearly catching up with his mouth. He shot himself, the driver, before they could get to him. Hold the phone, George said, resting his spatula against the hot metal with a fading sizzle. You're telling me we ain't getting any more patties cause some jackass took a wrong turn on I-95? The hell are we supposed to do? Sit tight, Dennis said, refusing to make eye contact with either one of us. Sit tight, George scoffed. Is that what corporate said? Man, fuck corporate, man. The realisation of the situation finally dawned on me, physically pushing me back before I could speak. So we're just supposed to sit here, I asked, unsure of what really to say. Chuck said there's a protocol for this, Dennis said, folding his arms and lowering his voice. He also said they're going to come for us, Stephen. Come for us? Without the patties, they'll be forced to seek after any available, well, brains they can smell. Namely, ours. It was at this point we were interrupted by Tina, who was attempting to appease the growing crowd outside her window. George, where the hell are the burgers? I got dozens of hungry customers waiting. George chuckled with a wave of his head, tearing his hairnet from what little hair remained atop his scalp. There's been a menu change, honey, he said, and we're all on it. Wait, what? She snapped. Just everyone calm down, all right? There's a protocol in place for our safety, Dennis said. Sullivan, nodding towards us underneath that you are not replaceable sign, plastered beneath the red-eyed security camera. He shot his glaze over to Chuck, 
who was still preoccupied with his extended phone call. Right, Chuck? Chuck looked up from his call with a blank expression. He clearly wasn't reading the situation. We've got a protocol in place, correct? Dennis reiterated. Chuck didn't say a word, and instead of replacing his silence, merely placed a finger over his poised lips. The hell is that about? George said, extending a finger at the one crossed over Chuck's mouth. At this point, our commotion prompted Rebecca to stroll into the picture, who really didn't do very much, given the fact that our lobby hasn't seen an ounce of life for over three months. Her job was probably another one of those keeping up appearances charades our corporate overlords seemed to love so much. Basically, they were paying her to play games on her phone. Can someone please tell me why it's so goddamn loud right now? Jeez! We all stopped our bickering and realised Rebecca was right. Even without our raised voices, it was loud outside. There must have been at least a hundred of the infected out there. Of course, the glass drive through window behind Tina only showcased a good handful or so, but from every other corner of the building, we could make out the groans and cries of the flesh eaters. Their bodies flailing against the walls of the building as thuds echoed throughout our tiny kitchen. We all instinctively looked over at the camera feed, watching straggling biters roam off the main highway and into the mob, which looked like a bundle of roaches, something we were used to here. Then the sound of glass shattering sent the group into a type of shared paralysis. None of us could move, and even if we could, where would we go? The pitter pattern of spongy feet across the lobby floor sent me into a type of fight or flight I'd never experienced before. I scrabbled towards the fire extinguisher, yanking it from the wall, aiming its nozzle into the stagnant darkness of the lobby. I felt the eyes of everyone else, including Chuck, burning into the back of my head, drilling thoughts into it to tell me I was crazy. I was. After what seemed like a year of waiting, a face emerged from the blackness, a mangled, pudgy, corpse-like face. It was that of a large man, his body pulsating with a vile stench of greasy oil and decayed flesh. Flesh that hung from his dark face, oozing with pus that seeped out of every pore. I didn't hesitate to spray the shit out of him. And when the extinguisher did little to deter the infected, I gripped the nozzle and began beating the zombie with everything I had. Once I landed several blows to the top of that mangled head, the zombie fell, limp, onto the floor. The inside of the building was now completely silent, apart from my non-slip sneakers as they crept up to the body lying face up with white hazy eyes reflecting the dimly fluorescent ceiling. I kicked the side of it once to make sure it was dead. It was, or at least dead enough. The sound of something clinking against the hard flooring broke my panting. I bent down pinching my nose hard as the oozing bile-like smell continued to fill my nostrils. It was the toy, one of our plastic toys from the bitey kids' meals. It must have fallen out of the zombie's pocket when I kicked it. I instinctively shot my glance to the unconscious face below me. I must have not recognised him due to the decay. It was Big Bruce. Okay, what the hell? I shouted, turning to Chuck and Dennis for answers. Cause at this point, I severely needed some. Chuck raised his hands in innocence, lowering them for me to calm down, though he knew we were all tired of his silence by this point. You've got five seconds to start talking, George said. 
Chuck sighed. <sighs> I'm going to be so fired for this, but what the hell? Chuck said, lowering his defences and breaking his silence. Being fired is going to be the least of your problems, man, George said. Chuck nodded stilly. The Bitey Corporation received a large sum of money from the US government. How large? George snapped. I don't know. Pretty damn large. They did some corporate-wide data analysis and realised they were better off post-outbreak, especially compared to our competitors. So? I said. So? He said, breathing in heavily before he spoke again. So they started putting shit into the food. What kind of shit? George asked. I don't know, Chuck shouted. Bullshit! George snapped back. Tallow, Chuck admitted. They started using beef fat for the oil. I watched as George's face contorted from rage to a frightening realisation. He looked back at me, then at the others, then at Chuck. So, you were saying we've been turning people into zombies? Chuck nodded, looking down at the floor. They were a staggering group sigh as we all realised what was going on. I looked up at Tina, perhaps the only safe one through all of this, given the fact that, ironically, she didn't eat meat. The rest of us, though, were screwed. Hope come it didn't work on Bruce until tonight, I said, pointing at the body before us. They've just implemented this new strategy, Chuck said, shaking his head. Only the newest shipment had the beef oil on it, that's why. George let out another sigh as heads continued to snap from face to face, eyes locking and unlocking. So what's the plan now? What's this protocol? Protocol is we hang tight. The cops have been dispatched, but the only road to this location is the road where the semi flipped. Dennis nodded. So you were saying we are fucked, George said. We all realised we were. The only way we could buy some time was to... No, we couldn't. I looked around at the others. I wasn't alone in my thought process. What are you all looking at? Chuck asked with a raised defensive voice. George nodded at us and grabbed him by the arm. If I'm going, George said affirmatively, you are going too, you son of a bitch. What are you talking about? We're supposed to... Hang tight, George asked. In case you didn't notice, we've got a hole the size of Texas through the front window. They'll be coming in any second. George began dragging the lightweight Chuck through the kitchen. He turned to face us amid Chuck's cries for help. If any of you all have eaten here since the last shipment, I suggest you follow us. At least you'll die with some dignity. George nodded a goodbye as he pulled Chuck through the opening in the glass window. I prompted Dennis to follow me as we upturned a handful of tables and barricaded the hole. As we shoved the tables in place one by one, we could hear the trill screams of Chuck and George, followed by silence for but a moment before the tearing of skin and snapping of bones resonated from the parking lot outside. We both queasily winced at the noises, gritting our teeth and bearing it as we returned to Tina and Rebecca in the kitchen. Both of the girls quickly adopted the terror plastered on each of our faces. I could tell they wanted us to comfort them or offer some reassurance, but both of us stood without a word. That is, of course, before the inevitable next question arose. Who's next? Another loud crash jolted us all from our silent stairs. Mine towards Tina, 
and the others towards the floor, stained with rancid blood oozing from Bruce's wounds. Time was running out, and the lack of sirens meant we were still on our own. The inhuman and disfigured voices chanted in unison around the walls of the small building, all reprising the collective request of BRAINS! All right, who's next? I said, sucking back a gasp of air and holding it tightly within my chest. The gazes from the others met mine, none in shock as if we all had the same idea. We can draw straws, Dennis said. There's some in the lobby. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Rebecca said. You were the one that got us into this shit, Dennis. You ought to go first. Me? I didn't... He paused, noticing he was outnumbered. He slowed his voice. I didn't do anything. Chuck merely asked that I kept quiet as to not scare you all. I had no idea about the beef. I swear. Maybe it was the fact that the brink of death was so close, but for whatever reason, I believed him. Obviously, Tina did too. Straws, then, Tina said. I nodded, hemming back a raspy cough as I stepped over Bruce's lifeless body on the floor, retrieving a handful of straws from the lobby. I felt a shiver run up my spine as I turned to face the glass window behind me. There were more of them. The infected studied me with wide eyes ripping from their sockets, without lids to hold them back. Their tongues glued to the chilled glass, hazed with what hot breath they had left. I swallowed a warm mouthful of spit as I returned to the others with the straws. Tina cut them up with one of George's kitchen knives. We all watched as she scrabbled the various lengths around in her balled up fist, unable to tell the difference between them. She held out her hand and waited. None of us dared to start. Screw it. I grabbed a straw, somewhat on the taller side. I was safe. Tina immediately followed. The largest, thank God. Then Rebecca. She reached in, yanking the smallest out. Shit! Listen, you can't! She fearfully stared back at all of us. I'm pregnant! Dennis's mouth dropped open at the bombshell. I honestly didn't have a comeback for this one. Bullshit! Tina said, calling her bluff. It's true, Tina! Rebecca said, nodding spastically. How many weeks? Twenty. Boy or girl? Girl. Her answers were pretty snappy. If she was lying, she was doing a damn good job. And that's when the biter entered the picture. See, despite our bureaucratic straw-drawing debate, the crawlers outside were far less cordial. It didn't matter that we were deciding who would be their next meal. To them, all that mattered is that they got it. I don't know how he got in, but he did. Out of nowhere, the walker ran in and clasped his jaw, unhinged like a snake, right down on top of Dennis's head, peeling some of his scalp off and cracking straight through his skull, spraying his blood all over that the customer is always right sign he had just put up last week. We tried our best to pry the thing off of him, but our efforts were in vain. Tina rushed by me as she pulled the emergency exit door shut. Somehow, the biter must have figured out how to use a door handle. Rebecca then handed me the knife Tina had used to cut the straws. And with one stab after another, I jammed the thing through the biter's face causing it to spasm and gargle on its own blood until it too fell limp. Rebecca helped hoist me up to my feet, overlooking the mangled corpse on the kitchen floor. We were both silently waiting for the thing to twitch when that emergency back door began to rattle from behind Tina. The squeals of the infected pushing their way through. 
Tina pounded on it as she screamed for them to stop. They didn't, of course. They kept slamming on it and I feared that cheap old door wouldn't be saving us for much longer. What now? Rebecca said, heaving with her chest. She looked at Tina and me back and forth. Now? Tina said, pulling the now red-bladed knife from the biter's face. You go outside, Becca. What? I said. What was Tina? Look at her, she said, staring intently at me. Does it look like she's 20 weeks pregnant? I don't know. I shrugged desperately. How am I supposed to know? Trust me, she's not. I am. You've got to believe me. Rebecca shouted. They're going to bust through that door any minute, Tina said. And the cops still aren't here, so we're all going to die if someone doesn't go outside. Tina held the knife up at Rebecca, who turned to face me. What happened to women and children first, huh? She cried. If you insist, Tina said, shouldering Rebecca towards the door causing her to trip over the body on the floor. I took a step back as the ensuing catfight began, ending with Rebecca being pinned against the emergency exit at knife point. Sorry, Becca, Tina said as she unlatched the door, forcing Rebecca into a swarm of the infected. Her screams <coughs> shot through the tiny kitchen until Tina slammed the emergency exit, muffling the shrill shrieks. Tina sighed, aside the fresh not frozen beef sign and pulled herself through the kitchen with what little energy she had left. Rebecca's screams cut it off as it was probable they reached her vocal cords on the way up to her brain. Everything became silent then, aside from the hum of perpetual moans that plagued the place and the ice machine. Tina stood before me wiping away a tear and sniffling. I sure hope she wasn't lying to us, she said. I nodded as I extended an arm, embracing her. You know, there's something I've never told you, Tina, I said. What? She said, her voice muffled as her cheeks dug into my shoulder. It's nothing, I said. No, go on, she said. I swallowed. If somehow I get the chance, I want to take you out. I said. Tina laughed against me. <laughs> Deal. Just as long as it's not fast food. I felt a smile widen against my arm. As I held on to her so tightly amid that cramped up kitchen, my nose atop her blonde locks. My lips pecking a kiss. The only thing that began running through my mind now was the taste of that number nine I had on my lunch break and how it smelled just like the inside of her head. And I hope you all enjoy the following blooper reel. What do lactose intolerant... What do lactose intolerant people eat for crying out loud? Now, if you've been... Now, if you've watched any horror movies, you might wrongly assume these things to be the living dead. He's convinced the stuff's He's convinced the stuff's made out of dead people. Oh shit, Dennis said, wrapping a tight fist around the chain. Oh shit, Dennis said, wrapping a tight fist around his chin as he bit down onto his knuckle. <clears throat> Excuse me. Within seconds it was swarmed by a mob of Roni. Within seconds, it was swarmed by a mob of roaming biters. Chuck said there's a protocol for this, Dennis said, following his arms. Chuck said there's a protocol for this, Dennis said, folding his arms and lowering his voice. <clears throat> Fuck's sake. Which looked like a... Which looked like a bundle of roaches. I bent down, pinching my nose as the... I bent down, pinching my nose hard as the oozing, bile-like smell continued to fill my nostrils.
I watched as George's face contorted from rage to a frightened real. I watched as George's face contorted from rage to a frightening realization. The cops have been dispatched. The cops have been dispatched. Followed by silence for. Followed by silence for but a moment before the tearing of skin and snapping of bones resonate. Hey family, please be so kind as to throat punch the like button and smack the arse of the subscription button as well. And remember to choke hold that notification bell and then select all. That way you'll receive all notifications each time I upload a new video. And by subscribing you'll be the first to see all of our new spooky creepypasta stories. A very big thank you to Mac Ralston for allowing me to narrate this awesome story. Make sure to check out Mac Ralston's creepypasta fandom profile for more brilliant stories. Also be sure to check out the Mac Ralston playlist here for more stories of theirs that I have already narrated. I would just like to say a very big thank you to all of the authors that I have worked with and all the ones that I will work with in the future. So thank you all my brothers and sisters. And why not hashtag cryptids roost in your comments. If you would like to support the channel I have an account at buymeacoffee.com you can send your coffee donations big or small to that site the link is below or via paypal.me slash cryptidsroost and don't forget to check out the end screen see above that will also list some more videos in my back catalogue take care everyone and I hope you all have a wonderful and peaceful night and don't forget where fear is happiness is not.